All right, good morning, lovers of God's Word. Let's get into Genesis 24. Thank you for joining me in this morning Bible study. And I truly hope the Lord blesses you as much as He did me. So, Father, I pray and ask that you bless us reading your Word. In Christ Jesus' name, we do praise you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Amen. It says, Abraham was old and well stricken in age. The Lord had blessed Abraham in all things, and Abraham said unto his eldest servant of the house that ruled over all that he had, he said, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. You notice the thigh before Jacob. Jacob's a few generations down the line, but it's going to be in the thigh that the sinew is sank when he's wrestling all night with God. Why is this? Well, we're going to have to do a study on why the thigh was a sacred place for putting a vow. Well, Abraham said to the eldest servant of his house that ruled over, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee to swear by the Lord God of heaven, the God of the earth. Thou shalt not take a wife of the son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go into my country, to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. I want you to notice that this vow is, is incredibly sacred. Now here is when your faith has affected everybody else. We're going to see that Abraham trusted God, and this is why he's in the hall of faith in, in the book of Hebrews. We get down to chapter 11. He looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. And this is why he traveled. He said, everywhere you put your foot, Abraham, I'm going to give that to your children. Do you know if you were promised an inheritance by God, and all you had to do was keep traveling to get more and more land, <laughs> you say, well, what's the big deal? You get in the RV, you travel. No. You see, when you're traveling on foot, with young and old carrying everything you have from place to place to place in a day where if you went near another king and by the way a king was anybody over 30 or more usually that you would either pay them homage or they would many times they would just kill you take your women and your, your it was a very hostile world Every man had to protect what he had himself. But you see, for Abraham, his maker was God. His protector was also God. So he makes this vow. You're going to notice that the L's capital, but the ORD's not. Now this is the name for the second part of the Trinity in the Hebrew. Okay? And this is where we get like Adonai. And it's speaking about Jesus Christ. You have God the Father is all capitals. God the Son is a capital L and then an O-R-D. That's why it's the Lord, capital, said unto my Lord, capital L-O-R-D. The Father said unto the Son, Ask of me and I will give you all the heathen for your inheritance. And he did. He's going to come back and take this earth. He's been given everybody. <laughs> I can't help it. I get so excited when I think about Jesus coming for us. It's going to be a great day. Well, the, let's get down here. So he says, I want you to swear by Lord, the Lord, the God, the Elohim, that's the Trinity of heaven. And this is plural. It means all the heavens. And that's why he reiterates the God of heaven. That means over all the heavens. He's also the God of the earth. He's saying this is the creator, the maker of man, the true Lord God, maker of heaven and earth. There's none greater. There is none greater. I've been doing a study on the names of God, and I found 108. But there's one name that is in every language, and it means just that. Every language on the earth has one name for the ultimate supreme God, and it's held by our God. Well, the servant says, but peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me into this land. But, you know, I can't make a woman come and marry your son. I don't know if Isaac was homely or what. I don't know. 
Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me again into this land. Must I needs bring thy son again into the land from whence thou camest? We realize he came from Ur of the Chaldees, which was a very civilized, it was the most civilized place at that point in time. So it'd be a city, big city. Well, they left the big city and traveled all the way over, and we're now knee deep in the land of the Canaanites, the Syrophoenicians. This is why people wouldn't want to go there. It was the land of the giants. <laughs> The giants are there until after King David. King David is the one that extinguishes the last of the giants that we read about. But during the days of Abraham, there were 12 giant races in that area. And many of them were cannibals. And many of them were 12 feet, 17 feet tall. There have been so many giant skeletons found that, that museums got to a point where they wouldn't take anymore. Um, what's interesting is like the Smithsonian Institute would send people out through the 1800s, 1900s to buy skeletons and then they burned them, they cremated them. They were trying to destroy all evidence of the giant race. That's a different story. So he says, Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? In other words, listen, what if she says she refuses to come here where you're at? Do I have to come and get Isaac and take him over there? Well, basically, he'd be saying you'd be joining yourself to them. Now, that was a common practice. In this day, you had to, one, you had to break a land and cultivate it, and you say, what's the big deal? <laughs> I've used modern equipment to break up hard, new, fresh land. I plowed for a, a farmer, and uh, I, I, and I mean, I have broken some of the hardest steel discs trying to go through a land that had never been broken. He got him another 101 acres and uh, paid me $14 an hour. He said, Tom, you got to go slower and ride lighter. He said, that land is so hard. And he's right. And there would be rocks, massive rocks sometimes. You had to clear the land, you had to cut the trees, you had to get rid of the rocks, but before you could do any of that, you had to get rid of the lions and the wild bears and the cougars. And, and you see, they had the whole spectrum. They had all of the wildlife. It was a lot of work. You had to also have your own army. You had to plant your own food. It was a big responsibility. You were in charge of everything. Everybody was a Renaissance man that was over a tribe or a group or the the whole group died. So he says, listen, do not bring my son there again. Be aware that thou bring not my son hither again. In other words, don't you dare take my son back to my old family. He said, the Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house, from the land of my kindred, and he spake unto me and swear unto me, saying, unto thy seed will I give this land. And he's pointing down this land on my people. And thou shalt take a wife. He shall send his angel before thee. And thou shalt take a wife and my son from thence. This is the angel of the Lord. I don't know if it's Uriel. I, I don't know if it's, uh, it's probably Uriel. I don't know which one. But it's one of God's angels. He says, if the woman be not willing to follow thee, thou art clear from this thy oath, my oath, my oath. Only bring not my son thither again. The servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master. He sware to him concerning that matter. The servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed. And the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and he went to Mesopotamia under the city of Nahor. You see, Nahor is still back at Ur of the Chaldees and the the fertile crescent valley of Mesopotamia down he's down in the southern end of Babylon and it's a very well to do place it was the most fertile place on the earth according to the uh, archaeologists both biblical archaeologists and um, those are outside of biblical fields but it was called the crescent valley and the life or cradle of mankind where the oldest of mankind was and that would be true Abraham was called out of there 
And so I study a lot of archaeology, and what's interesting, it was the most fertile place on the earth. It's also not far from where Noah's Ark went down. So, he made his camels kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening. The time when the women went out to go draw water. Now that's an important thing. So this would be the, th you have the 6, which is 9 o'clock, the 6th hour. You have the 9th, you have, you have 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock. Those are the three acceptable times. The men go at 9 o'clock. Okay, that's why when Moses got there in the morning and he had to defend the daughter of Jethro because she shouldn't have been there, but Jethro had no sons. So Moses drove the men off that were mistreating them and then watered their camels. You have noon. The only ones that would go at noon because of the heat of the day were those that were shunned by the city or outlawed. Because at noon, everybody else would be taking, lifting their hands and praying to God. They would pray at 9, noon, and 3. Well, then the women would come out after prayer at 3. So this is important. It's in the evening. So it's when the women are all going to come out to draw. He says, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day. Show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold. I stand here at the well of water. In other words, and the daughters of men of the city come out to draw water. You're saying, now, is he just too lazy to get himself a drink? No. Nobody wanted to drink after everybody else. That's only in the, the spaghetti westerns. <laughs> in the least, they have wells and they have ropes. But you take your own pitcher to the well and lower it down. If he just left a pitcher in the water, one, it would get it would get algae and green, it would ruin the well. So you didn't do that. So he doesn't have something to draw water with. Came to pass the damsel to whom I say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink, and she shall say, Drink. I will also give thy camels drink. Also let the same be that which thou hast appointed for my servant Isaac. Thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness to my master. You know, this is faith, because that's a pretty big request. It came to pass before he'd done speaking. Behold, it's, it happened so quick. He's not even done praying. And behold, she's right there, Rebecca. She come out, born to Bethuel, son of Milka, the wife of Nabor, Abraham's brother with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin. Neither had any man known her. This means she hadn't even talked to another man outside of her family. This was a respectable girl. And we need more of that. The movies, TV, entertainment. I'm sorry, but and I, I may be an old fisher or an old relic, but like when my son Jordan, when he was... Uh, 16 and we went to see him play basketball at school you know the cheerleaders were bent over doing cheerleaders shouldn't do the things that these were doing I was embarrassed for them I was the only person that spoke against it and was rebuked by my own mother-in-law said just get with the times I said no that's those are people's daughters and they shouldn't be doing that and enough said but Rebecca wouldn't even put herself in a position to talk to another man. She's, you know, it's normal for people to be flirtatious and such, but it's noble when you push those down and say, Lord, I want to honor you. And that's what we should all do. Amen. I want to honor God. That's why he gives you a wife or a wife. He gives you a husband. You love all people, but you, you faithful to God and to your spouse. Well, She's very fair to look upon. She went down to the well, filled her pitcher, and came up. The servant ran to meet her and said, Let I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. She said, Drink, my lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him a drink. So she's getting ready to walk back. But he says, Wait a minute, can I have a drink of that? She says, Here. When she had done giving a drink, she says, Listen. I, in other words, she saw he didn't have the ability to do this. 
Here's somebody in need. Here's what a good Samaritan does or a child of the living God. She says, I'll tell you what. Just let me. She emptied the pitcher in the trust. She says, let me draw for your camels also until they've done drinking. My friend, when you take ten camels across the desert, this servant alone has ten camels just for Abraham. Now, there's other men with him. Most people don't know that, but when we get down to verse 54, you're going to see that there are other servants. Why? Because he's transporting probably about a million dollars worth of gold. By today's standards, you say, what? That gold is by the pound that's on that girl and that it gives to the parents. Much. Abraham was very wealthy now. So, she, so why don't we say... Well, it wasn't one pitcher full per camel. It, it was probably a minimum of three to ten pitcherfuls per camel. They say up to 23, 30, 30 pitchers, you know. So she's going to be drawing water for at least, you know, for at least, heck, I would say an hour, two hours. That's a lot of work. The man wondered at her, and he held his peace. He stepped back to see if she's going to do all this work. Verse 21. The man wondering at her held his peace to wit the whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. You see, that's why I said this was a big request. Lord, let her not only give me a drink, but let her say she's going to water my dromedaries. I can't emphasize how much work this girl's doing. She's probably sweating. You had to drop that thing down and then let it, you, you had to do this with it so it filled up and then pull it up by hand. That's an extreme workout for your lat muscles. He's wondering whether she's going to do it or not. She might give out halfway through, right? Say, whew, man, I'm done. Can't you pull some of this water up for me? Are you going to stand there like an idiot? Because I don't know about you, but the older I get, I have to repress grouchiness. And Martha syndrome can set on people quickly. Listen, Lord, I got a lot of work to do. Now, I'm trying to be nice, but you could at least offer, or have one of those guys over there offer to pull up some of this water. That didn't happen. So it came to pass, when the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight. Two bracelets were her hands of ten shekels weight of gold. And said, Whose daughter art thou? Shekels. We're talking weighing out into the pounds now. I pray there, is there any room in thy father's house for I to lodge in? She said, I'm, I'm the daughter of Bethuel. Which means the house of El. Beth El. Bethuel. They had named this place also the house of God, the house of Elion. We have, moreover, both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. The man bowed down his head and he worshipped the Lord. He said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who's not left me destitute. Now, this is getting kind of long. Basically, he tells them how he had put it in God's hand. And you know what? Laban immediately says, all right, let's send her away because this is of God. Why? They really loved the Lord God there. Why? They had been worshipers of idols, but the faith of Abraham had gotten all the way back to them. How come? You see, Lot was Abraham's nephew. He was Nahor's son. He got taken captive by five kings. Abraham went with 300 servants of his house and whooped five kings and brought back Lot and all the people they had taken captive. The word of Abraham and the faith of Abraham spread and Abraham's God went back. Abraham went out to obey God and God in return took the Holy Spirit back to Abraham's home, saved the household of his father and his siblings. Now isn't that wonderful? You know what's even more important is they had heard of the Abrahamic promise. They had heard about how God had promised to give Abraham a child. And Abraham said, but Lord, I have nobody. Let me please 
have my head servant. And then he had Ishmael, and he said, no, I'm going to give you your own child. He said, Abraham, if you can count the stars or the sand of the sea, that's how many children you'll have. And it's true, everybody that's believed on the Lord God is a part of the seed of Abraham. The first promise was in the book of Genesis, where the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And then he called forth Abraham, and he said, I'm going to give you a city. I'll be the builder and the maker of it. I'm going to give you a seed. You're going to be the father of millions. When we get down to the end of chapter 24 here, that's exactly what Rebecca's family says to her. This is why they're so anxious to send her back. They believe the promise of the Messiah. And they knew that she was going to be the one to fulfill it with Abraham. So they blessed Rebekah and said, Thou art our sister. Be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. That means you're going to be the, the child of God. And the seed, the promised Messiah, will come through you. Shiloh. I hope this has been a good study for you this morning. Lord bless you in Christ's love. Amen. Thank you, Father. Amen.